Hello everyone, my name is Magnus Madsen from Aarhus University. Today I'll tell you about polymorphic types and effects with Boolean unification. This is joint work with Jacob van der Poel, also from Aarhus University. What we want is to design a type and effect system for a real-world programming language that can separate pure and impure computations. So for example, the expression 1 plus 2 is pure, whereas the expression console print line hello world is impure. Using the type and effect system, we can enforce that higher order functions take function arguments that are either pure or impure. For example, we can enforce that the function argument passed to a set that exists is pure. This is useful because it means that the implementation details of set do not leak. For example, if we allow an impure a predicate to be passed into exists, then it could print the elements of the set, revealing the internal order uh, that the set stores its elements in. By forcing the predicate to be pure, we ensure that such implementation details do not leak. In a similar way, we can also write higher order functions that require impure function arguments. So for example, when registering event listeners, we can require that, that the functions passed in are impure. This makes sense because event listeners are only executed for the effect, never for the return value, which in this case are unit in both cases. We can also use the type and effect system to rule out nonsensical programs. So here's a small uh, main function. There is a list consisting of the elements one, two, and then we apply the list map function, mapping the function x plus one over the elements of the list. Then we discard the result of this computation, returning one, two, three. If we try to compile this program with our implementation, it will tell us that there is a useless expression. This list that map expression is redundant. And notice here, the fact that this expression is redundant is because this function we map over the lists is pure. So the entire expression is pure and computing a pure expression and throwing the result away is useless. As I said in the previous example, we can use our type and effect systems to express higher order functions where the effect of the function itself depends on its argument or arguments. Here's the signature for map. So map takes a function from A to B with effect E and a list of elements uh, of type A and it returns a list of elements of type B with effect E. So this function, whether it has an effect or not, depends on whether its argument has an effect or not. We say that such functions are effect polymorphic. We can also express uh, function composition, in this case forward function composition. So given a function f from a to b with effect e1, a function g from b to c with effect e2, we can return a function from a to c with effect e1 and e2. In other words, this function is pure if and only if both f and g are pure. Okay, let's take a step back and consider a purely functional programming language such as Haskell. So in Haskell, the following identity holds. So if you have a map function and you map f over the result of mapping g over a list l, well, that's actually the same as mapping the forward function composition of f and g over l. And in doing this way, you only have to traverse the list once, whereas here on the left-hand side, we traverse the list twice, constructing an intermediate list in the process. Now in an impure programming language, this identity does not hold. For example, if this is f and this is g, and they are printing the elements before simply returning them, then evaluating this expression here will print 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, corresponding to traversing the list twice. Whereas if we uh, compose f and g and then map them, then we will see the elements in a different order. So this shows that in general, in the presence of impurity, we cannot perform this composition. However, using our type and effect system, we can rely on the following observation. If at most one of f and g has a side effect, in other words, it's impure, then it's safe to actually perform the map fusion. So if both are pure, it's fine, or if f is pure and g is impure, or vice versa, then it's okay. And so we can express this, for example, as a combinator here. So here I require a function from a to b with effect e1, and then I require a function g from b to c with the following effect. So the way to read this is that if we consider E1, so let's say E1 is impure. So in this case, E1 is false. Well, then in this case, this Boolean expression evaluates to true. So then G is forced 
to be pure, pure. So in other words, these two Boolean constraints here ensure that map compose is only called with at most one impure function. Okay, so in this example, uh, we had a, a type written, the rates written in our implementation, but we, we can also write it here more formally in math. So we have this uh, very polymorphic type. And as it turns out, uh, we could also have written the type in the following way. So here I've just swapped which effect are on which arrow. And so an important point of our work is that these two types here are equally most general. That is, one is an instance of the other and vice versa. Hello, my name is Jakob van der Pol from Aarhus University. I would like to show you the theory of our type and effect system. We stayed close to the standard hendley milner type system for ML because it's well understood. We just extended it with effects. The main advantage of the system is that it can compute principal types. And we extend this to principal type and effect inference. Recall that type inference is based on unification. So the main task that we have is to extend unification to Boolean unification. Let me illustrate this with this example. We want to apply this higher order function g to the argument f. Well, there is a small problem. f has effect x and y, and g expects something with effect x or y. This is only well typed if x and y and x or y can be unified. There are multiple solutions. x and y equals false is a solution of this equation, but x and y equals true is also a solution of this equation. But there is a most general one. We can just map x to y, and on the left and right we get y and y equals y or y. And those terms are equivalent indeed in the Booleans. Another example is here if we try to unify x and y with true. The only solution is that x and y are both true. The last example, x and y equals false. Here there seem to be multiple solutions, x could be false or y could be false. But the most general solution is actually to map y to not x and y. More generally, every Boolean algebra admits most general unifiers. This is a result that dates back to George Bull himself in 1847. He also suggested a procedure to compute the most general unifier, solving an NP-hard problem. Back to our type system. We have type judgments of this form. In a certain context, this expression has a type and an effect. We could probably extend the calculus with multiple effects, for instance, to handle exceptions, but we didn't do so. Here's the rule for function abstraction. The type of this function lambda x dot e is tau 1 to tau 2. But what happens to the effects? Well, if we evaluate e, we get an effect phi. And now this becomes a latent effect, which only is released if we apply this function. So what happens to application? We try to apply an expression e1 to an expression e2. And then the effect of this expression is the combined effect of evaluating e1, which is phi1, and evaluating phi2, which is phi2, and also the latent effect is released. The final rule that we show allows us to replace a type and an effect by a type and effect that are equivalent, moglo Boolean equivalents. The main result that we prove in the paper is that pure terms evaluate properly and do not have a side effect. To do so, we must fix the evaluation order. We choose the standard order of eager evaluation, left to right evaluation, and shortcutting if then else. Let's define soundness and completeness. In this setting, soundness means that if an expression E is pure, then evaluating it will not show a side effect. On the other hand, completeness would mean that if an expression has effect false, then evaluating it would show a side effect. What is the situation? In our calculus, soundness holds. 
This means that pure terms will never have an effect. However, completeness does not always hold. Some terms might have effect impure, but still show no effect. What about principal type inference? Well, we extended algorithm W from the hindley milner type system. And by doing so, we also show that every expression in our calculus has still a principal type. I only illustrate this on an uh, application. So let's compute the type of an application E1 applied to E2. We recursively first compute the type and the effect of E1 and E2. Now if we have the type tau1 for E1, then the application is only well typed if tau1 is actually a function type. So we get a unification problem checking if tau1 is equal to tau2 arrow something with the effect something else. So in order to solve this unification problem, we need to do most generally unifies modulo Boolean equivalence. And that's why we apply Boolean unification. The question that remains is, is this complexity acceptable? Can we afford using an NP-hard procedure during type checking? The first answer, the theoretical answer is, well, this doesn't matter because the basic ML system is already X time complete, which is more complex than Pi 2. But this is not completely satisfactory. So we have a second answer. Well, actually, it depends on the actual behavior on real world examples. And for this, I will hand over back to Maurus Messen, who will show you the experimental evaluation. We have implemented our system in the Flix programming language. So Flix is a functional, imperative and logic programming language that has many of the common features of ML style languages. Now, in the context of this work, the overall empirical research question is that given Boolean unification is NP hard, is it actually practical to have a type and effect system where we need to solve uh, such problems during type inference? And so in the paper, we consider four research questions. We consider what is the impact on the size of the types when we enrich the type system with these uh, Boolean effects? What is the performance cost of effect inference? What is the importance of simplifying Boolean formulas during type inference? And what is the performance impact on end to end convolution time? Now, due to lack of time, I will only address uh, research question two and four in this talk. And to evaluate this, we consider the Flix standard library, which has approximately a thousand functions, and we consider some uh, Flix applications. In total, we look at about 30,000 lines of Flix code. Okay, so looking at the Flix standard library, it is divided into a, a collection of modules shown here. And if we just consider, for example, the list module, we can see that there's more than 900 lines of code. There are 95 functions of those 41 are higher order. So they take function arguments and we have designated 15 of them as requiring pure function arguments. We have designated three as requiring impure function arguments and 23 as effect polymorphic. So they work both with pure and impure function arguments. Turning to the second research question, we consider what is the performance cost of effect inference? So this scatter plot here shows the running time of type inference with and without effect inference. So looking at the graph, we can make some observations. First, we can see that there is a performance cost, a slowdown of between 1x and 2x. So the points that are near uh, the y equals x line means that there is no overhead and the points that are up here show that there is some up overhead, maybe up to a factor two. Second, we can see that the performance is uh, quite predictable. So there is indeed an overhead, but we don't have points lying all the way up here or further outside the graph. All the points, all the data points are shown in the graph. Uh, so in summary, this graph suggests that there is an average performance cost of around 1.4x. Okay, turning to the fourth question, we consider what is the performance impact on end-to-end -end compilation time. And so really the reason we have this question is because even though there is perhaps up to a 2x slowdown on the time uh, it takes to do type inference, type and effect inference, that is not the only thing a compiler has to do. So we want to look at the whole uh, compilation pipeline to see how much does this actually slow down the compiler. And here the results suggest that there is a slowdown uh, in this range here. So for some programs, there is not much of a slowdown. For others, there's maybe up to 1.15x. So in summary, we conclude for this experiment that this uh, average slowdown is probably around 1.1x, 1 .1 1 
which we find to be acceptable. Okay, I just want to end the talk by saying that our implementation is open source and freely available. We have a website you can go to where you can read more about the programming language and try it out uh, online. Um, we also have a Visual Studio Code plugin, so you can uh, write a Flix program, download the plugin and play with it there. And so in summary, what we've seen today is a polymorphic type and effect system. So the type and effect system is able to separate pure and impure expressions. It is effect polymorphic, so higher order functions such, such as map can be made to work both in pure and impure contexts. The system supports type inference and effect inference. It's based on Boolean unification, which is an NP-hard problem. But despite being NP-hard, experimental results suggest that the overhead is manageable, maybe for type inference in isolation, a 1.4x overhead, and in terms of end-to-end -end, uh, compilation time, maybe a 1.1x overhead. And so we think this is a practical approach to uh, effect polymorphism.